other uh, lessons in uh, the lab sheet uh, just on the screen here. So if you can't see the lab sheet, maybe come forward. Or if you don't have it on your machine, maybe come forward and have a closer look. Okay, so this is IPython notebook. Um, so this first command here that I've actually now split off, this command here is a special command in IPython. It's called a Python magic command and it allows us to um, tell IPython that we want the plots we're going to make. It tells us to use PyLab, which is like the data processing environment, and it tells us to the plots we make, we want them to be in line. So this allows us to make plots which will appear uh, inside the window like this. So that's what the inline command's doing. And then we import the... I don't think you actually need to do this if you've said PyLab, but just good practice, I think, to import the... Um, the libraries that you want, so the numpy which provides the array type in Python um, and then we normally import that as np and pylab which provides the plotting and various other things I think we normally import that as pb and then gpy which is our software we import as gpy now we're not going to really be using gpy much today um, but it's good to have it there so that you can test it so when we use it tomorrow that works so, I can write these commands, I can write import OS if I wanted to, and I can press return and nothing happens. I'm just editing code. If I want the code to run, I have to hit shift enter. So now it says kernel busy at the top. When I did shift enter, it says kernel busy. I get a load of uh, warning messages about GPI that I think you shouldn't get, um, and the codes run. Now, the next stage, uh, it says, to get help about any command in the notebook, simply type that command followed by a question mark. So, the normal distribution. So, if we want to sample from any random distribution, uh, that functionality is provided in the np.random library. And if you tab complete, so if you write np.random and tab complete, you get a list of all the distributions that you can sample from. So, look, there's gamma. So we could ask for gamma, and then if I open brackets and then tab complete again, it gives me the shape, scale, it tells me what I need to do. So if I wanted to do from a gamma, I could set the shape parameter, and then I could set the, set the scale parameter, and then I can set the size. So the size gives me the dimensions of the array. So a 10, 10 would give me a matrix 10 by 10. So let's just... Uh, I'm just taking that out for the moment. And since it's a bit like in MATLAB here, you know, I, when you don't put a semicolon, if you don't assign it to anything, IPython notebook will return what you've dissampled. So these are gamma samples, yeah? Or we can make the same thing with Gaussian density samples. So just paste in the old command there and assign them to a variable x. So that's now... Um, A variable x, uh, which doesn't print because we've assigned it. Yeah. Now let's look at the samples. We can show them using the print command. So print x just gives us these samples. Yeah. So it's wrapping around here. I've said size 10. Now Python, IPython notebook naturally turns an array. If you say a one-dimensional thing, it returns a one-dimensional array. If I want that to be um, a column vector, I'd have to say like this. Yeah? 10 comma 1. I kind of, it's not a feature I'm that keen on. I kind of like my standard things to be in column vector format. But notice here it's shown two brackets either side of the data. Yeah, these two brackets are telling us that this is a two dimensional array. There is something in IPython called a matrix class. Do not ever use it. Don't ever touch it. You always use this array class. It's got some features that are not ideal, but. If you confuse matrix and array, then it really uh, makes everything a real mess. So uh, I'll just set that back to 10, what we had before. And then we see a one-dimensional array. 10, 1 gave us a two-dimensional array. 
Um, and if I do that again, I can get a three-dimensional array. Yeah, so now I see three brackets and things space in this funny way. Or I could make the first dimensions unit dimensions and the second two dimensions. Uh, there, so now I see bracket, 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 array, bracket, bracket, bracket. Those brackets are telling me the dimensionality of the array. Okay? So let me get back to what the lab requested, which is the one dimensional. Now these arrays have Python, they're Python objects and they've got certain properties. So we can do things like compute the mean. So in fact, if I tab out on array, so I've now got this object, the array, and if I put dot and then I tab, I see all sorts of different things I can do to an array. So can anyone guess what that one is? Transpose, yeah. Uh, which is quite useful. Um, some of these I didn't even know. So flatten takes a, a three-dimensional array and, and puts it down to one dimension. So if we had like, if we'd set x to be like this. So there's x with the three brackets. So in fact, let's make that clearer by putting... Uh, so now x is three-dimensional, here's three brackets, and there's also two columns, some sort of structure here. But if we print x.flatten, then we just get a one-dimensional array of everything stacked. So in MATLAB, that's equivalent to uh, something like... Uh, that's like saying x uh, colon. Yeah? Uh, now what would happen if we do x dot transpose? I'm not sure for three-dimensional things. Okay, it sort of did some sort of transpose. If we do this, let's make that clearer. Uh, that's an annoying feature if uh, it loses space. So there's x dot transpose. If we print it x on its own, then we get the row vector. Yeah? Now be a bit careful. I get a bit confused. Py Python is passed by... Um, reference. So uh, this can cause lots of problems. So z equals x. Okay? So now the question is um, z let's ask what z1 is. So indexing starts from 0. Yeah, so the first element of x is 0. Um, oh! Oh! Sorry, let me get that to an array. That's giving me the entire first row of x. So that's what I want. So obviously that's the same, right? So now we'll say x 0 equals 2.5. And then the question is, what is this? 2.5. So be very careful about this. You see what I'm doing here? z is equal to x. So I've done an assignment. Now in MATLAB, or R, R would have a totally ridiculous two-character assignment, wasting enormous amounts of typing time. Um, MATLAB, this would mean a copy x into z. But in Python, it's uh, just copying the reference. So it's not passing all the memory around. So when you get then later edit this, you're changing everything for z as well. So basically, if I print x0 and z0, they're the same thing. Oh, see, I've already... <laughs> yeah, of course, I'd need to redo that. Um, yeah. So, the random number there, now I've set x, z to x, so when I set x0 to 2.5, I also set z0 to 2.5, because they're the same object. And that's contrary to what you expect if you've used R or MATLAB or something like that before. And this is such an easy bug to have in your code. So, I can't remember, is it, is it deep copy? Yeah. I think, is it copy? Arr. Okay, so look at that one there. Uh, I think that's the right way of doing it. So you've got to get this copy in. That's a pain and it does introduce bugs, but actually leads to more efficient coding, I think, probably in general, because you don't tend to pass enormous matrices around in your code. Naturally, you just pass references to matrices. So, for example, in the GPy um, 
code, you store the data in one place. If you decide to pass the data to somewhere else, you're only passing a reference to data. You're not copying the code. You're never in danger of doing that. Of course, if you do pass the data somewhere and you write over the data in that region, then you've written over the data everywhere and that can cause bugs. So, I don't know. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? Who knows? It's an indifferent thing. It's got some advantages and some disadvantages. Uh, so let's get that back to print x. Okay, so um, so we've been looking at some of the commands you can run. Here's another one, the mean. You can also get the variance, and of course you can again ask. So axis. So what do you think the axis command does? Yeah, whether row or column variance. So if we would go back up here and say things like. Um, uh, 10 comma 15 then what do you think that command mean will do on its own? Well it returns a scalar, it takes the mean of the whole array MATLAB would return a vector um, but if you say axis equals naught, remember we're indexing from naught then you get an array of the length there, if you say axis equals 1 you get an array again, it's not a column vector Ah, yeah, I don't know how I feel about that. Sometimes I feel that's good. Um, sorry, the first one should have been a column vector, shouldn't it? And this one uh, is a one-dimensional array. So the answer to these things is one-dimensional arrays. Um, so here's a question I don't know the answer to, but I can have a guess. If I make it a size like that, I reckon it will return a matrix. Yes. Yeah. So it's now taken the mean of a series of matrices in one go. Does that make sense? So what I did there was I created a three-dimensional array. That's that, all that mess we can see there, because I printed it. Three-dimensional array, 10 by 15 by 10. And then we said we'd like the mean of that array along the second axis. So I suspect that the result should be a 10 by 10 matrix, right? So we can find out the shape of an object like that. And uh, <laughs> the reason that flies down is because all that stuff here disappeared. So it's a 10 by 10 object because we've taken the mean across the 15 dimensions. This ends up with so... Uh, sometimes when... You, it takes a while to think about the right operation to do in Python. But when you get it right, sometimes the code is so much more efficient. Because these operations like this are actually occurring in um, BLAS and LAPAC. They're occurring at low level. So this is the, you know, quite a nice sort of feature. Um, so variance, yeah, We've got the same thing. That's taking the variance of all, uh, all the values in that array. So let's get it back down to a one-dimensional array again. Okay, broadcasting. Does anyone know what broadcasting is? Broadcasting is an interesting feature of... Uh, let's see, what's the best way to demonstrate that? I'll start a new thing here. I'm going to say x is equal to np.random.normal uh, scale equals 1. So the scale is like the standard deviation, the location is the mean. Shape equals uh, 20, comma 10. Now, here's the thing. Let's say that was the data. Oh, is it like that? It was upset. Did I do something wrong? Uh, sorry, it's not shape. So I do that mistake a lot. Size. Um, now, that's like pretend that's the data set, right? So data should have data points in the rows, okay? I believe. Now let's take the mean of it. That's one thing we're often interested in doing is the mean of x along that axis of the data points, yeah? So axis 0 is where the data is, um, and that's gonna, that should give me a vector, which is 10, dimension 10, yeah? Now, something you very often want to do is take the mean of x. Okay, the mean should be 0, but it's actually non-zero. We want to center x. Now, if you're doing MATLAB, what you have to do now is um, x minus something evil like this, 1's 
20 comma 1 times mean x. Yeah, people recognize that type of thing? Uh, with maybe a transpose there, something like that. Oh, that's such a horrible operation. <laughs> I mean, you're actually expanding the mean into, uh, you're doing some unnecessary, a more correct way in MATLAB of doing it would be, um, uh, sort of like you could use RepMat, 20 comma 1 comma mean x. Yeah? But still, that's taking up a lot of memory. If you've got a million data points, you've just repeated. But that's the only way to get MATLAB to do it without doing a for loop. You want to avoid the for loop because it's slow. Well, broadcast means that you can simply do this. Now, I did warn about the dangers of doing this, but this should be all right because it's creating a new object. Oh. Okay, so that's zero to numerical position. Yeah? So minus 5 times 10 to the minus 18, 5 times 10 to the minus 17. So we're subtracting a vector off, and what Python does here is it says, oh, he doesn't, you can't subtract an array from a matrix, so it broadcasts. It means it copies that mean vector down like 20 times. I think that's good and bad. I think sometimes that's really bad. Because it means you can do things like this. So let's create x as a um, 10 by 10. So, and then we'll create, well, in fact, let's call it a. And then when you create b, is mp.random.normal log equals 0, scale equals 1, size equals 10, 1. OK, so now I've got a nice column vector and now I'm going to happily do this so uh, in fact let's call that x and then let's call b equals a times x okay that looks good doesn't it ax equals b yeah so that looks like a nice thing to do uh, so let's print b so what do we expect b to be now what size so if I present b dot shape what size do we expect b to be Oh uh, yeah, people who know Python will know what it'll be. What do people who work in MATLAB expect B to be? That's a matrix multiplication, right? So it's a 10 by 10 times a 10 by 1. 10 by 1, okay. It's a 10 by 10. Because I just set you up, because it's not a matrix multiplication. It's an array element by element multiplication. And in MATLAB it would throw an error. So in MATLAB this is equivalent to saying this. Right? But now Python is secretly broadcasting that operation. So the error occurs silently. And you might think, okay, that's all right, because at this next operation, I've got a 10 by 10 matrix, so I'm going to be all right. But what happens if you then decide, as your next operation, to do B dot sum? So now... Oh... Of course, that doesn't work because that's MATLAB syntax. So now we've got this. So we think we've summed across a one-dimensional row. Actually, this one works because <laughs> this one's a stupid example because <laughs> it actually works. Uh, let's try VAR. Um, but what we really wanted to do here was this, np.. Dot dot. Horrible, horrible name for matrix multiplication. I've heard various justifications as why it's called that. But matrix multiply is np.. Dot dot. I think it's because it's a broadcast dot product, which is one way to think about uh, matrix multiply. Another thing I'd encourage you to do, which is why I laughed when I did the sum, is sometimes this is really useful. Don't even put down the matrix multiplication. I mean, I don't think this is a good feature of Python, but I think sometimes this is a useful thing to do. I'm not sure maybe experts would disagree. Sum axis equals, uh, I think, one I want to do, right? That is actually, um, so if we print that, print uh, mp dot a comma x. And I've got that the right way around. I think axis zero should have been, shouldn't it? Oh, why is that not working? mp dot a dot x. 
That's a multiplication than a sum, which is a matrix operation, isn't it? Okay, I've confused myself now. Something I expected to work didn't work. Um, that's definitely matrix multiplication, A times X. This is, ah, sorry. This is why it's not working. Uh, and let's get the axis right. Maybe it's axis zero. In fact, let's stop that problem being able to happen. Okay, yeah. I've now transposed x, broadcast x down a, and then summed across there. And if you think about what that operation is, it's matrix multiplication. Which is why I think people think there's this dot is a sensible thing. Because that's like a dot product between a and x. Uh, it's all a bit ugly. So now these things match, right? The result of this is the same as the result of this, because this, it just in a long-winded form, is a matrix multiplication. I've transposed x, boom, and then I've done the broadcast multiply, and then I've summed across that axis. Um, now that, oddly, it, it's very difficult to think about, but sometimes there's these very nasty Kronecker forms, they appear in the code. Um, which are quite hard to do efficiently, but then they work really well with these broadcasts. So these broadcasts are amazingly efficient for some very complex things, but I can never, it takes me ages to think about them and they're a bit cryptic. So that's, I don't know, it's maybe a disadvantage of Python versus MATLAB. So there's, as so someone mentioned earlier, there's this, this um, oh, you know, what's the future? Maybe the future is uh, something called uh, Julia which is supposed to be, um, uh, you can't see that, presumably. Uh, uh, and I can't get to my menu on it. Uh, but Julia is a language which I, I hope will have the advantages of MATLAB and Python. Maybe not, we'll see. But it's an exciting language, which maybe, she isn't mature yet, uh, but it's fast and it has the nice syntax that MATLAB has. Some of the nice syntax is in Python, but some of it's a bit broken. Okay, so, Let's just see that we've got x. Right, what we're going to do now is a quick for loop to look at convergence of um, sample means to true means. So what we're doing here is saying, um, actually I don't like capital N for data, so let's call it small n. Um, we're saying create a list. In Python this is an empty list and variance is an empty list. This is a list containing elements. These are not arrays. Lists are different uh, than arrays because lists are, you can append things to them or delete things from them. And I think they're not necessarily contiguous in memory. Um, let's just set that up to how we've been calling it before. Uh, okay, so what I'm saying is for n in samples, 10, 50, 100, 500, 1,000, 5,000, 1,000, 5,000, uh, 100, 50,000, 100,000, take a number of samples from that Gaussian, compute the mean, compute the variance, of course we could just do that with x dot var, but there's the variance formula, and then to this list of means and variances, append mean and variance. Um, so if I run that, um, and then Oh, by the way, I'm, I'm just using key commands to insert blocks. When a block appears like that, I'm typing Control M B, which makes a box a box appear. So then, if I print means, I got this list. But notice, if I try and do things to means, I can't do them anymore because uh, I, I get a different set of things. I get append, count, extend, index, insert, pop, remove, reverse. It's a list, not array. So we have this command called as array, which will convert that list into an array. Um, so if I reset means equal np as array means, now when I look at means, I get all those other things before. So lists, different types of structures, they don't really exist in MATLAB, I'm not sure about R. We often create them with arrays of things. But they naturally exist in Python. In fact, Python has lists and dictionaries and even for loops actually iterate over lists, which I don't know is a bit of an odd thing. Um, 
So they're more for each list loops. So it's for each n in samples is the way I read that. Um, means is equal to np as array means. Okay. So now we've got means as a, an array, and in fact that's exactly what we do below for plotting it. Because to plot this stuff, um, the first thing I've done is convert them from lists into arrays, and then ah pb. I can do a plot. Now the plot in functionality is it comes from something called matplotlib which was very much inspired by MATLAB so a lot of it's quite similar to what you might expect so um, pb.semilogx if you're familiar with MATLAB you should recognize that type of command or if we just want the regular plot we've got that command or if we want to do things like include I don't know make the labels crosses MATLAB people should be familiar with this so now the labels are crosses. Um, it's automatically, with the LaTeX, it's um, automatically uh, encoding. That's hard to see, I know. But here it says log subscript 10 N in italics. It's taking this and turning it into the natural thing. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of similarity between that functionality and MATLAB functionality. And then what we're seeing here is, of course, the mean is converging to zero because we sampled from a zero mean uh, Gaussian. So law of, law of large numbers says that should happen. Uh, we can do the same thing for the variance. So for the variance, trying the same thing. Um, it converges slower, and we expect that to be the case because it's dependent on the second moment. And the second moment converges more slowly than the first moment uh, under the law of large numbers. So. But again, same thing, we've got some convergence towards 1. So 1's here, starting around here and moving around. Okay. Now I'm a bit worried that this command might not work for some of you guys because um, we had problems with it at the winter school. But we'll try and fix that if that happens. So one of the things we're trying to do in GPI, so this is the only GPI command in this lab class, but it's just for downloading data sets. So we're trying to make data sets that we're using as standard available to uh, people to download and test things on. So this is a pre-processed version of that data set. It's not stored with GPI, but when you call this for the first time, um, are people managing to call this? It should ask you if you're, well, it should give you a load of information about the data and download the data automatically. I think it will then try and save it to a directory it can't write to. Certainly it will if you're on Linux. But if you're on Windows, it might work. So has anyone managed to run this command? Is anyone managing to do this? Is anyone on the lab at all, or are you all following on the board? No? No one's done this? Okay, well, this is the command in GPI. So this guy's good. Yeah, does it work? Yeah, okay, so what you should get, so in fact, I'll try and recreate what you get um, when you do this sort of thing by. Uh, uh, let's. Uh, so I've got the data set. Oh, no, I can't do that because I don't have internet. I would re download the data set, but I don't have internet, so I'm not going to do that. So. First time you run this command, it downloads this data set to your hard drive. Next time you run it, well, it checks every time. It checks. You specify a directory you want to store data sets in. It checks whether the data set's there. If it's not there, it downloads it. So the idea is ease of getting data into your computer. And then we store it in this structured data, which, has, which is a dictionary, and we're putting things called data x, data y. So that's loading in the data. And that's the data we've been looking at in um, the lab class. So I can plot that, and then what I see is the data that we've seen so far in the labs. Okay? Oh, what am I doing? So we want to minimize this er error. And what we said was that we could do a... Um, iterative solution for minimizing this error yeah so the iterative solution is to optimize M and optimize C optimize M and optimize C and I showed you that in the class in the lectures going zigzagging down the slide and that's what we're going to do in this next section what we need is an initial guess for M so 
When I click and do this, I'm just running that bit of code. And you see it updates the number of the code. This ordering, by the way, look, it's telling me, so I know that this bit of code hasn't been run because it was last run 24th. And yet I've just run up 87. So here's this formula here for the update. Actually, it's one of those formulae that's actually, I think, simpler in Python than it is here. It's pretty hard to see what's going on, isn't it? But then when you write it in Python, you're just saying, oh, C is equal to Y minus M times X, the mean of that. Yeah? It makes it quite clear what's going on. So let's run that. So we started off with C is 80, but that's not affecting anything. But given the M that we've chosen, it says that the apostles must have ridden, run marathons in 786 uh, minutes per kilometer. So pretty slow. Uh, I think even snails go faster than that. But once we got that update, then we have this one here, which is a bit more complicated. M is equal to Y minus C times X. Now here, Y is a vector, C is a scalar. Obviously, it's broadcasting that. The times is just doing an array times operation. And then we're summing the top there. And then we're dividing by this thing squared. And then I'm summing the result of that thing squared. Yeah. So you see these little bracket things and stuff like that. I can do that in Python because the output of this thing here is an array. And I'm just asking it to sum the array. So I think that reads fairly easily. There's some things in Python that might read worse, but I think that reads quite nicely. So now we've got our value for C, we update our value for M, and what do we get? We get the, the new update for value for M is minus 0.3998. So it's moved like no distance away from the minus 0.4. And this is the problem with these updates. So we can do a test for how good our fit is, now, this isn't the best way of doing it, but the, what I'm doing here works for nonlinear functions as well. So I'm doing it this way. So I'm giving an X test, which I'm putting 130 points. This command lin space gives me 130 linearly spaced points across the X axis from 1890 to, to 2020. And it's creating it, um, this form here is just to turn that one dimensional array into a two dimensional matrix. Um, it's something you'll see right quite a lot. I don't really want to explain the details, but it allows, it takes this, the output of this is a one dimensional array, and by putting this here, it says index that array down the first dimension and then add a dimension on, um, which makes sure that it's in the form of a design matrix, which is the way I like to represent things. So then we've got this value for M and X test and C, and I'm calling it F test because it's the output before the noise. And then we can plot what these predictions look like. And of course, they look absolutely terrible because this gradient is too large. So the fit isn't very good. So we need to do this iteration. Do M, then C. Do M, then C. Do M, then C. Um, and that's what I've set up here in a little for loop for i in npa range update m then update c yeah and then print m and then it should be print c i suspect underneath so let's do that <laughs> and it actually doesn't move very much does it <laughs> so it's still there in the same position basically so let's see how many how many iterations would you like me to try 100. Okay? So there's, there's the fit after 100 iterations. Still looks the same. 1,000. Oh, and remember, all the old iterations we've done, because I haven't reinitialized M and C, are in the memory. <laughs> okay, now it's moved a bit, minus 0.28. Uh, <laughs> Not still awful. So, what should we get? 10,000 or 100,000? Okay, 100,000. Now we're getting. Oh, what happened there? So, that's the original one. 100,000 iterations, and now we're getting something reasonable. So, 100,000 iterations of update M, update C, update M, update C, update M. So if anyone ever asks you, why do I need to know about linear algebra? This is the answer. I mean, <laughs> because just simply 
in effect, what's going on in the linear algebra is that correlation is being accounted for and the optimization is being done directly uh, to solve for both at the same time. So the direct solution with linear algebra that we looked at before, now I need to turn, I need to build this design matrix because I need to introduce this basis of ones. So there's a description of that there that I want to represent things as a function of the inner product of X and W, where W now contains M and C. So the first element of W, W0, is C. The second element of W is going to multiply by this guy, so that's M. Um, and then I want to represent the entire data set as a design matrix, which, uh, as we saw in class, is something of this form. And I can do that. This is one way of doing that. I'm not saying it's the optimal way. Um, so this 8 stack commands takes two vectors so this ones like x thing says give me a vector of ones of the same shape of x and then x is our original x and then 8 stack says put the contents of this and stack them horizontally together so doing that gives me this design matrix so I've got the years along here it's pretty ugly because these are in thousands and these are all one um, and that's the design matrix and we know from uh, the class that we saw the uh, um, this was the solution and I put in here just a little thing about empirically showing um, oh what's going on there uh, you know why right, because I didn't run this code up here let me uh, just do that let's make sure I run all the code So that operation there, matrix multiply of x transpose and x, um, gives us this 2 by 2 matrix, which is also equal to the sum of xi, xi transpose. Now, we could try doing the same thing in a for loop. So here's the for loop. Store is zeros of 2 by 2. For, uh, go across that x and keep adding in x, x transpose. Yeah, this is the vector version, so this is taking each vector as an outer product and then print store. So if I run that, I just see the same thing. But this is the matrix version. Why is it, I mean, there's potentially all sorts of optimizations Python might be doing for you under this one because it knows it's got a matrix operation. You might have parallel matrix optimizations going on that could all be done seamlessly for you that you don't have to care about. You could, of course, do a parallel for loop, but then you'd have to require some thought there. So the point is, avoid this type of representation and use this type of representation, the matrix algebra one, because underlying it, all that work is being handed over to low-level uh, Fortran routines like BLAS and, and LAPAC if it's a solver or something like that. Um, the, the processing times. Yeah, I, I could if I knew how. Yeah, now you're just displaying. You just wanted to display my Python ignorance. Um, if I had the internet, I would search for it. But uh, you can do the processing times. Probably wouldn't make a super difference for this, but as you get very large, it would make a difference. It's the same in MATLAB. People know this for MATLAB, right? In MATLAB, you don't do a for loop to sum things up. You do the... Uh, matrix operation. The different thing in MATLAB, of course, if you want to do a parallel for loop in MATLAB, you have to buy the parallel toolbox or something stupid like that. Uh, in Python, you just hope someone else has already done that for you, and very often they have. Um, okay, so but now we need to solve the linear system. So here's the, uh, just asking the function, the question, what does this np.linalg.solve do solve a matrix system or system of linear scalar equations so a linear matrix equation ax equals b where a is a matrix x is a vector b is a vector so that's the right thing so let's get rid of that um, and in fact what we want to do is solve the system where the matrix a is x transpose x and the matrix b is x transpose y done that's the solution so it is of interest to go back and see how close we got to the solution I mean that's the solution to numerical precision so let's just have a little look up ah well we got them down here so 
Um, so that's W. So what happens if I go, oh, what happens if I find the right key? Print M print C. So yeah, one two nine eight oh six four seven seven. Yeah, we did get it close with a hundred thousand iterations. That's good. Um, twenty eight point eight nine five two four seven. Twenty eight point eight nine five two four seven. Yeah. So it's there to like seven significant figures with the iterative solution. They're giving us the same result. But of course, this is a one shot solution um, with this solve command. Um, the numerically unstable way of doing it would be to do something like w is equal to np.inf of np.dot uh, x dot t comma x uh, np.dot dot x dot t comma y np dot dot something like that. Not quite, apparently. Ah, oh, no, np.linalg.inf. So a lot of the linear algebra, I don't know why they're in this separate thing, but they are. Um, there's probably a good reason. So that's solving the same thing, but that's less numerically stable. Um, this is, actually, I think we've got polynomial examples uh, later where it's a problem to solve it in that way. Okay, so, uh, so there's the fit, same as before. Now, of course, this, the nice thing about that bit of code is that it allows us to easily extend to the um, a basis function approach. Now we're building a matrix phi, where phi is h stack of ones, x and x squared, and we can solve the system just as before. We're just changing. We're just calling x phi instead. Yeah. So because I put the test data as a linear sort of spacing along the input. Now my f test is w2 times x test squared plus w1 times x test plus w0. And I get the quadratic fit. Yeah? Nice and easy. So that's easy to extend. I can just, uh, I could just go in there and extend that further and we'll do that further below. So, um, one thing I, Rather than writing this out as uh, W2 times X test plus W1 times X test, blah, 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 the more general sort of form would be to, you need a command for setting up your phi. So here we're just doing it with the X test, uh, a matrix of ones like X test, a matrix of X test, a vector X text, and a vector uh, X test squared. H stack them together, and now instead of doing that written out thing, I'm just saying F test is NP dot five test time, comma w so f test is phi test times w which is just the matrix version of what we've had before so of course we see the same result oh. if we actually run this command here first we see the same result uh, now so it's worth having a look at w um, <laughs> now notice this coefficient here is really quite small. 1 times 6 times 10 to the minus 4. Why is that? Why is that so small? It's the coefficient associated with the quadratic term. Yeah, I would say that if you normalize x so that it has some standard deviation. Yeah. It's Good answer. So the solution why if you don't want it to be small is to normalize x. Because x is going from 1896 to 2012. So x squared is order 2000 squared. So in order for it to be valid in this region, it has to put a very small coefficient on x squared. That's why polynomials are a rubbish basis. The right answer, if you want to use polynomials, is to map to the region minus 1 to 1. In that region, you'll get fairly well-behaved coefficients. But they're a very odd basis because they just behave very very badly as you leave the region of your data where your data is fined because as numbers go higher you're just multiplying very big things and I mean this gets worse with cubics 
And it, with polynomials in general, you get big problems with numerical stability, trying to find these coefficients, because you just get these basis. This basis matrix phi, if you use it in a naive way and you don't normalize and all these other things, um, it basically has a, a row of ones, and then a row order 2,000, a row order four, uh, 4 million, a row order... <laughs> sorry. Uh, I have been a, not had much sleep. Um, <laughs> a row order 8 billion. And, and the coefficients have to down multiply that. So very rapidly you get to the region where the coefficients have to be order 1 times 10 to the minus 16, which is computer precision. So you get massive numerical problems with polynomial bases. Um, now I think it's called the Bernstein basis is one way of solving this, but you still end up with domains where these polynomials are, are effective. So they... I mean, well, one way of solving this is to map everything to minus 1, 1. So we could scale down on the inputs to move all these years in between minus 1 and 1. That works. And then the Bernstein basis is also some kind of basis which helps us do that. It's a different polynomial basis. But they only do these sensible things across particular ranges. So if we map it down to minus 1, 1, and then we sort of say, how fast would... John the Baptist have run the marathon, we're suddenly back in the region of minus 7 or something like that. Uh, much more than that, minus 20. So when we do a, a backwards prediction or an extrapolation, these polynomial effects come back in. And that's why you tend to see these very broad error bars for polynomials. They do crazy things. So they're a convenient basis computationally. There's things like the gradient of a polynomial is a polynomial. So people like to use them for solving differential equations for things like that. Um, but they're not, in general, a very good basis for modeling data. Um, so that was just a side issue there. Uh, okay. So... So the last bit here, I think, is just solving that system and looking at um, the sum of squares error. So setting sigma, looking at the sum of squares error and looking at the data and computing um, that plot I showed, but for the actual error function. So you've got, I'm giving you a little bit of code to start playing and illustrating here. So if we look up here, I'm just for looping across different order polynomials. So uh, blah, 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 blah. that's to get Python to pause. This is a display module for Python so that we can clear the display and bring the display back up. Um, and I'm just setting up a couple of figures. The fit and the predictions are basically done here. Yeah, that's all the code. And it's not even efficient code because I'm just rewriting everything twice, once for the model fit for the training data and once to get the prediction curve. And it's doing it across different model orders, different degrees of polynomial, yeah? So uh, here I'm building the, um, the polynomial basis in a for loop. Not necessarily an efficient way of doing it, but just for illustrative purposes. And then we're storing the error. So the error in this case is the sum of squares error um, plus this log variance term that we've added in. And then what I'm plotting down here with this little bit of code is clear the axes, plot the predictions for x versus x, plot the training data, set the limits of the axes to something sensible so that they always look uh, the same so you don't get the axes bumping about for different fits. Um, set the title to predictions for order blah um, and then build a second plot in the second plot what we want is uh, to plot zero up to the order plus one plot the error list so those as arrays plotting the error as time's going on and then do some stuff with the x limits and y limits to stop them bouncing around each time set the title to training error and display the figure sleep for one second and then clear the output. So if we were to change that to sleep for two seconds, we would see for longer. Oh, sorry. Yeah? So you're just seeing it, plotting each fit and then plotting the error. So that code is 
easy to modify if you just wanted to do leave one out, cross validation, start visualizing things like that. Um, I think that the IPython interface to doing this sort of stuff is improving all the time. Uh, my memory is that I had to upgrade to this version of Notebook to get this clear output working. The previous version didn't have it. And if you look online, the community is really, really active in developing new ways of displaying. There's a, something called Plotly that people are pushing. So these plots aren't very interactive. All you can do is scale them up there like that. You can't do stuff. But I think with Plotly, there's a chance for plots to be more interactive. These plots were designed to appear in separate windows. That's like in MATLAB. And if they appear in separate windows, they're very interactive. But basically, a lot of people are being influenced by um, Python to move in different ways like that. OK, so what we didn't cover today, because you all looked so tired, was uh, what's coming next, which is the Bayesian uh, regression. Um, I think actually all this is, we did sort of cover. Uh, we didn't cover computing the posterior. So maybe we'll save that for next time. I'm conscious that in you know um, if you'd been going through this on your computers, you would have been going through it a bit slower than I've gone through it. So I don't know what's best for people. How many people have been able to run the lab and play with this stuff? I think it's now good for you guys. What I would have done if you'd been going on your computers is that I would have gone around or a few of us would have gone around individually and started making suggestions. So suggestion one, for example, is, uh, well, what happens if we do what I suggested in the... Um, uh, oh, it's getting trapped on those things. If we do what I suggested in the lab class, and it's a little bit difficult to do, but let's try putting np.exp y here mp.exp f test and np or log y okay so now what I've tried to do uh, and let's get rid of this line what I've tried to do just here is actually do that model in log space whether I've succeeded in doing it or not, we'll see. Um, so we get very different coefficients now. So this is the linear, ah, fail. Uh, uh, why is that wrong? It's going up to 200. It shouldn't be going up to 200, should it? Ah, no, 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 I don't want to do that, sorry. That's right, because I just logged Y above, didn't I? There we go. Okay? So there's the log model. It's actually not that working that well either. So this is log linear. So you can this slightly curved. Um, why is that not working that well? I don't know. Maybe uh, I need to think about that a bit more because uh, it's the first time I've done it. Um, why is that not working that well? I don't know. Oh, we could also try um, adding on to it. Um, ah, now I'm a bit loath to do this. I want to. Uh, okay, so something that you can, you guys can try. I'm not sure I can do it quickly enough. On here is actually offsetting x. So what happens in all these models if you do what was suggested? I mean, it can be done up here, and then you can just go through each part in turn. Sort of, so what was suggested was, well, we could normalize x. x is equal to x minus uh, x dot mean. Um, x equals x divided by mp dot square root of x dot var. Let's see if that does the right thing. 
that didn't do the right thing. Uh, ah, because I did the wrong X in my X. X. X is bad for that, isn't it? So look, now we've, we've standardized the data. And so if you go through doing these plots now, the linear model will come out looking pretty much the same. Ha! Huh. Ha! Huh. Uh, the linear model will come out looking pretty much the same. But, I mean, that's not working because basically this range is uh, 1890 to 2020. So... So the linear model looks pretty much the same, doesn't it? Um, See if we can get to that log linear. I'm curious about that one. Yeah, we don't seem to gain that much on the log linear either. So this is, you know, you can just try different things with this data, play around, see how it feels, um, and uh, if you've got it up and running for the next, uh, how long have we got, Mauricio, now? And uh, yeah, we go uh, half past five. Half past five. So we can have a break. That's yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, yeah, sorry. No, I know I want them to work more. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can stop. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yeah, we'll, we'll break now. Um, we'll try and maybe uh, explore where we are with the internet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. People need to also get um, their IPython notebook installs going. And then you can go through rerunning the examples of I've done them, playing with the data, trying different things, developing your understanding of IPython. So tomorrow when we start going towards Gaussian processes, you're worried more about the Gaussian processes and less about uh, a new data environment. Okay? <laughs>